You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. This week, we join Pastor Gary Ziegler as he teaches on the subject, Exceedingly Growing Faith, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is being confirmed in my life with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. We're talking about exceedingly growing faith, so would you please look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, exceedingly growing faith. That means our faith should be growing exceedingly. Our faith should consistently increase as we apply God's Word in our lives. So let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter. Paul, writing to the believers that were in Thessalonica, he was letting them know that he appreciated and respected the fact that they as believers in Christ Jesus were growing in faith. I remember as a child, as you're turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I remember as a child I, I thought, well, I've got to grow up. And how I was going to grow up physically, I didn't know how that was going to take place. I just knew that they kept telling me, my parents, that I was going to grow up. And I would look at my little small hands, and I'm thinking, how am I going to get big hands? I would look at my little ears, and I'm thinking, how am I going to get big ears? And I'm looking at the size of my head when I was a little boy, and I thought, how am I going to get a big head? Don't make any comments on that. <laughs> how am I going to get a big head and grow up? And how does all of that work? Eyeballs, tongue, teeth. I'm looking at my little size, and I'm thinking, I'm going to grow up to have a big body. And sure enough, I grew up. Now, in my growing up, I thought about this. What's going to happen, though, as my parents, who were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, how are they to grow after they've already grown? In other words, once you physically grow up and you're no longer going to get any taller, your, your foot size is not going to get any bigger, then what's left to do if you're not growing up physically? Ah, great question. As a Christian, we're required to grow up spiritually. We're required to grow in faith. And we're to be spiritually minded and to make sure that our spiritual body, which is our spirit, the person that lives on the inside of us, the person who makes this physical body work, we're supposed to be focused on spiritual things. And we're supposed to grow up in our confidence in the Lord. So we have 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, yes? And we'll look at verse 1 as the Apostle Paul writes. Paul and Savanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, and that word meet is the old English word for able, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Would you please underline those words, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Paul was telling the believers in Thessalonica that he was bragging in the Lord on their faith, which groweth exceedingly. 
He was saying, I can talk to other churches, Galatia, and Ephesus, Colossians, Corinthians. I can talk to other believers that are gathered in those regions, and I do it with joy. I do it with a gladness because what I'm going to say concerning you is that your faith groweth exceedingly. Verse 3 again of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity, which is the old English word for love, the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. That means not only is your faith growing, but your what? Your love towards one another is growing as well. And we know from Scripture that faith worketh by love. And since faith works by love, they had a kind of faith that was genuinely bringing results, making a difference. And do you know something about these believers in Thessalonica? They recognized that in order for their faith to grow, they were going to have to be students of the word. They were going to have to be committed to trusting in the word that God had given. Because if you're going to walk by faith and not by sight, if you're going to grow in faith, you have to identify that first of all, there is such a thing as faith. Now we do know from scripture in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, turn over and let's look at that together. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we have scripture that informs us about faith. We know that the scripture says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's all say that again. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith does come. But how does faith come? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if an individual says, I have faith, then we must conclude that faith that we're supposed to grow in in an exceeding way, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Is it possible for a person to have faith without the word of God? No, because faith only comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Can a person say, I have great feelings and I've got great emotions and I know God exists, but I tell you what, you know, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. Well, you may have hope, but the hope that you have is not going to be established and come to pass by faith because you've got to have more than feelings. And more than just an excitement, you have to have the promises of God known in your heart. And once you believe on the promises of God in your heart and you confess them out of your mouth and you walk in line with the promises of God, you're going to have faith in operation. And Paul told the believers there in Thessalonica, he said that I can talk about you to other believers because your faith is growing in an exceeding way. Now let's turn over then in our Bibles and look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. And we'll see how that the believers that were in Thessalonica, they got a hold of the fact that they had to receive God's word for what it really was, God's word. That they couldn't consider that the scriptures are something that you can just hit and miss whenever you want to. They had to place themselves in a position to say, we're going to focus and major in on faith because faith is what is necessary to please God. According to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible says that it's impossible to please God without faith. So if it's impossible to please God without faith, then that means that faith must be available. And it also must mean that there can be people who have no faith. 
And so we know that the believers that were in Thessalonica determined they were going to major on faith. Why? Because it pleases God and it allows for God to move in their lives in ways in which Paul the Apostle said, I can talk to others about your exceedingly growing faith. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Acts 17, verse 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now we'll read verse 10 for the purpose of inquiring why Paul made the statement in verse 11. Verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these Berean Christians and these believers that were in Berea, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, or Thessalonians, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Are you getting an insight here as to how those believers that were in Thessalonica came to become known as people with exceedingly growing faith? What happened? Well, Paul let them know that the believers in Thessalonica, they were not as noble, they were still Christians, but they were not as noble. What does noble mean? Well, noble has a reference to they were really forthright and they were really willing to be bold and confident and assured of the position that they took. These believers in Berea, they were bold and they were getting results. And Paul said the believers that were in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica or in Thessalonians. Why? Because, read verse 11 out loud together, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So Paul said, the b believers in Berea, they heard Paul's preaching, but they didn't just say, Okay, that was a nice sermon. No, no, no. They received the word with all readiness of mind, and then they went and started getting into the scriptures themselves to make sure what they were being taught by the Apostle Paul was actually so. And you know, you become more noble when you know that you know that you know that you know what you're being given is accurate. Because you can literally stand on and live by confidence in the written word of God. When an individual just says, well, that was a great sermon, Whew. <clears throat> but they don't really dissect and receive and take what they've heard and go to the scriptures to make sure what they were taught was actually so. If you don't do that, you can't be as noble as those, as those who were in Thessalonica. I mean, in where? In Berea, thank you very much. I heard somebody else say, yeah, what do you mean Berea? Exactly. Now, let's look at Scripture here. <clears throat> Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans, the 12th chapter. We who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ can grow in faith. The Greek word for faith, F -A -I -T -H, the Greek word for faith is the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, P-I-S-T-I-S, pistis. And the word pistis means to have confidence in. It means to rely upon. It means to put yourself in a position where you depend upon and you have trust in. So when an individual says, I have faith, they mean that they're having what? Confidence in, they rely upon, they're depending upon, they're literally trusting in what the word of God has to say. 
We who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ have a responsibility to be informed in the scriptures to receive the word with all readiness of mind. That means we don't discount scripture. We receive the scriptures and we do what? And we compare the word of God with the word of God to make absolutely certain what we're being taught is exactly lining up with scripture. And when we do that, it builds a confidence. It builds a knowledge of saying, I can walk this way because the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. I make my decisions from what the written word of God has to say. And so in, in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul, the apostle, says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and that you be not conformed to this world, but that you be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, and that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Would you circle the word prove? Prove? Prove means that you can show of a surety that what you now know or have is literally what it is. So when we say we receive the word of God with all readiness of mind and we're searching the scriptures daily, we're literally what? Allowing the scriptures to prove themselves out. And when you have proof of something, then you can be sure of it. When you have proof, then you can rely upon it. And you're not going to be wishy-washy, vacillating backwards and forwards, and you're not going to be entertaining anybody's private interpretation of Scripture. Why? Because you are willing to search Scripture for yourself and allow Scripture to bear out what it's saying for itself. The Word of God is alive and powerful. The Word of God renews our mind when we receive it. So you want to be a person who what? Who accepts the word and allow the word to renew your mind. Because when my mind is renewed, what do you mean renew my mind? I'm recording the scriptures on my thinking. I'm allowing God's word to wash my brain. I am intentionally being brainwashed. I'm intentionally brainwashing myself, my soul. Why? So that I would be able to prove what is that good and what else? Acceptable and perfect will of God. That means I'm in a position where I absolutely know what the will of God is for my life. And I know how to get results with God because I've chosen, I've taken time to wash my brain with the word. Now, if I can sit down and allow myself to be influenced by a, a, an instrument called a computer or a television, and submit myself to all kinds of advertising modes that tell me to have confidence in their products, I certainly could sit down before the Word of God and allow my brain to be informed as to how to trust God. That's my reasonable responsibility. And that's, as a believer in Christ Jesus, that is our what? Reasonable responsibility. And when we do that, we can know what is that good and that perfect and acceptable will of God. Now, turn in your Bibles then to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, as we talk about exceedingly growing faith, we know that as believers, once we are introduced to Jesus as a a person who came out of darkness into God's marvelous light, as I now, as a physically grown person, 
Not discounting that children can't grow up spiritually. They can and they should. But I'm just now going to put it from the position of one who is physically grown. I'm not getting any taller. My arm span's not getting any wider. My shoe size is not getting any bigger. So if I'm going to live my life growing, that growth process has to be what? Spiritual growth. I've got to grow up spiritually. I've got to mature spiritually. And who better to know about it than an adult that's already physically grown? See, when you're physically grown and you're not getting any higher, don't ask me to play basketball against seven-foot high guys because I'm just not going to be able to. I've got an infirmity of about two feet plus. <laughs> the infirmity means shortcoming. So I already know I'm not built to play basketball. I can play, but not on the level as the NBA stars. Why? Because I recognize there are certain physical limitations. But does that mean that I'm limited in life and my ability to do things? No. I'm required to be spiritually minded. I'm required to know how to grow in the Lord spiritually. You're there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? Great, 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 great. 1 Corinthians, right? Yes. Chapter 2. Yes. Who doesn't have it? Don't say it. Okay. All right, I'll begin reading at verse, uh, verse 8, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. And it's so good, if I look up any higher, I may read the rest of it, and we'll go to Genesis 1-1. But I'm not going to do that. We'll just, go to, we'll just go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, here we are. Verse 1, and I, brethren, when I came to you, Paul saying, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save except the fact that Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. <clears throat> now, what Paul is saying is that I am a physical man. <clears throat> I am spirit, but I live in a physical body. And because of that, when I approached you and brought the gospel to you, I had things that were going on in my body too. I look at your faces and it's like, Ooh, do I really want to open my mouth and speak? And Paul was like, I'm looking at you, so I, but I had to get past my flesh. I had to get past my physical reaction and I had to focus on my spiritual responsibility. That's what he's saying. Verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. That your what? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith should be in the power of God, not in the wisdom of man. And in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle talks about how that man's wisdom falls short of the wisdom of God. Because man's wisdom says that God is foolishness, but yet in God's foolishness, God created the world and all the universe that we observe. But yet in natural wisdom, natural man says, God may exist, it may not exist. <laughs> so God says, you know what? There is a difference between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. And Paul said, I want you to have confidence in the power of God, in the wisdom of God, and the preaching of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 5 again, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. That means that 
Our insight, our teaching, and our preaching is going to give you information, but it's going to be revelational mess, uh, information. It's going to be information that is higher than natural information because natural information has a limit. But God's information, there is no limit. You'll walk in the wisdom of God and you'll be truly informed. The wisdom of men tries to discount the reality of him who made man. Now, how can a breathing human that gets his life from God say God doesn't exist? That's foolishness. But that's what people do. So he goes on to say in verse 6, Howbeit this, this, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes, that means those that are in position of power that are influenced by the devil, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. The devil and all of his demonic hosts, they're coming to be less and less and less having an ability to run people's lives. Now, wh whose lives are they having a less and less ability? Those that are walking in the wisdom of God. The more you walk in the wisdom of God, it's kind of like an airplane that takes off on the runway. Once that plane is up in the air, you just feel different. You could sense that what? We are now, we're in a different element. We're in the air. Our, our landing gear has been retracted, and now we're looking at headwinds, tailwinds. We're looking at altimeters. You're looking at all kinds of factors that govern you when you're flying, but the person who's flying in the airplane is a person who's different than the one who's walking on the ground. The person who's walking on the ground or driving on the ground, they're dealing with stop signs. They're dealing with signal, traffic signal lights. They're dealing with police pulling them over and giving them a ticket. I'm saying if they break an infraction or if they make a mistake or do something that they shouldn't do, they're, going to, they're dealing with different elements. They're dealing with pedestrians. In the air, you don't deal with pedestrians. You're not concerned about jaywalkers when you're flying in an airplane, are you? And you're not concerned about a speeding ticket when you're in the air, are you? No, why not? Because you're in the air. You're, you're still aware that the earth is beneath you, but you're just not focused on the things that people are focusing in on that are walking on the ground. And you know, as a believer in Christ Jesus, I recognize this. God told us to keep our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. That doesn't mean we're not conscious of the earth, but we just don't allow the earth to govern us and dictate to us how we're to get results with God. Because our faith is not in the wisdom of man. Our faith, our confidence, our trust, what we rely upon is in the wisdom of God. Let's keep on reading. Now, we do know this then, that the spirits that are governing wicked men, the spirit of the devil and his cohorts, those spirits are called the princes of this world. And he says here, they come to not. Now, what do you mean come to not? Having less and less influence over us. Less and less ability to govern us in what we say and do as believers in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto what? Our glory. Our glory. Now, what glory? The glory of the believers in Christ Jesus. Are we supposed to manifest the glory of God? Absolutely, we are. We're to walk like believers, walk like those who are not trapped to just walking on the ground. We're, we're supposed to live like people and walk like people who are walking by faith and not by sight. Now, notice that he said in verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. That meant that God already set us up to win before he even made the world. God set us up 
to win before he even made the world for us to be born in the earth. God has set us up. And that's beautiful to know because no believer should be living a losing life. Every Christian is supposed to be used to winning. David said, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. I'm going to watch us win, and Paul is concerned about believers winning, and he's going to tell us, listen, he said God already preordained that we should walk in victory or walk in the glory of God. He already ordained that before the world was made. Verse 8 now, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That means that the devil and all of his demonic hosts, they would have never crucified Jesus if they had known that when Jesus rose from the dead and that he would rise from the dead and he would be the head of a new creation people. We are new creation people. And Jesus is the first one born from among the dead. And here we are coming after him. And all of us who believe on Jesus were called new creation people. Now, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. But it says in verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Keep your finger here at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What are we doing? We're going from scripture to scripture. Why? Because we're being like those that were in Berea, which eventually the Thessalonians did. And that is, they received the word of God with readiness of mind, and then they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not those things that were spoken unto them were actually so. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That means we who have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you're a new creation person. You're a new creature. Now, as a new creature, what's our responsibility? To grow up. I'm a new man. And he tells me, behold, all things have become new. I'm to then what? Grow up in my new creation self now. Now that I'm born again, my nature is of God. Now that the Spirit of God lives inside of me, I have a responsibility to grow up spiritually. That means... As one who is growing up spiritually, growing up in faith, having exceedingly growing faith, I've got to be able to say, I can measure my growth. I can believe God for more now than I did when I first believed. When I first became a Christian, praise be unto God, I knew then if I died, I was going to heaven. But then what about from the time I accept Jesus to the time that I go to be with him in heaven? I'm supposed to live my life growing up in faith. And the more I grow up in faith, the more I'm able to trust God for, and the more it's going to affect what I have to deal with in this world. Now, we see then in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, let's read it out loud. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, what does behold mean? That means pay attention. Look, beholding. You have to what? You've got to become aware that now that you're a new creature, you've got to do things by the new creation information. I like that. You've got to do things by the new creation information. I am a new creature. Some people say, well, see, you that talk about faith and believe on faith, you guys call yourself God. God needs no creator. God is the creator. 
We who believe on Jesus have become new creations. What is a creation? One that is made of God in Christ Jesus. So we couldn't possibly be calling ourselves God. We're children of God made in Christ Jesus to carry out the will of our Father, but we're beholding that all things have become new. And the beholding that all things have become new is referring to the spiritual reality of who we now are in Jesus. What privileges now belong unto us, our inheritance. What can we do now that we are new creation people? Turn back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In the knowledge of who I am in Christ Jesus, I have a responsibility to behold this information that God makes available to me. And Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that if the devil had revelation insight, if the devil had complete understanding of how God was going to make a new creation people, if the devil had have known that a whole new breed of people would be made out of humanity from the Jewish background, from the Gentile background, God would make one new creature in Christ Jesus, the devil and his demons would have never crucified Jesus. Why? Because we who believe on Jesus are that much of a problem for the devil. Now, you may not know how much of a problem you are, but you're going to find out how much of a problem you are for the devil. You may not know all that you can do with your faith in Christ Jesus, but you're going to find out about what your faith can do. Move mountains. Your faith can change things. Your faith can change circumstances. Your faith can cause you to live a whole different kind of lifestyle above the norm. When you find out about what your faith can do, whew, you are a problem for the devil. And the devil says, let me find somebody that doesn't know. But I'm choosing to grow up in faith. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you there? Verse 9. Well, I'll start at verse 8 and read our way to verse 9. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Now notice, natural eyes cannot see. Natural ears do not hear. And natural man has not an understanding in their heart what God has done for us who believe on Jesus. And that's the reason why we as believers in Christ Jesus, we must be informed because you're a different person than you were before you accepted the Lord. Now that you're a new creation person, you got to learn how to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can't go to the world and go to natural universities and learn this information because they're not going to tell you what you can do. They're not going to tell you what belongs to you. They're not going to tell you what you have in Christ Jesus. They're not going to tell you your authority in the Lord. They're not going to tell you that if you use the name of Jesus, demons flee. They're not going to tell you that the joy of the Lord is your strength. They're not going to tell you how to raise your families like you should in the Lord and how to prepare yourselves to run nations. They're not going to tell you that in natural school. Their motivation is totally different. They're natural information. And when you come to church, you're learning spiritual information, according to Colossians chapter 1, that you have spiritual understanding. And God said, I has not seen, neither ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. Somebody said, whoo. Ooh, I tell you what, the, the Lord is a mysterious God. No, he's not a mysterious God to them that love God and to them who are willing to listen to God and grow up and learn and be noble in their faith in God. But an ignorant Christian can say the Lord works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Well, he's only a mystery to you because you refuse to learn. 
But ignorance is a what? Curable condition. God is a mystery to those outside of the body of Christ. People are still questioning whether God exists or not. But to them that are Christians, you know God exists. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You receive the new nature. Now God says, let me reveal unto you. The word reveal means let me make known. Let me shine the light on this. Let me make it apparent to you what's there before you. Because once you see and, make and are aware of what belongs to you, you'll take advantage of it. And he says, and the world can't see this. All they can see is us who believe on Jesus, who are ambassadors for Christ. Now, he said he reveals this unto us by his spirit. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're talking about exceedingly growing faith. But verse 9, he says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. How many of us love the Lord? We do. So God says, I got some things that are prepared for you. Amen. So everybody say, I'm going to get into those good things Amen. that the Lord has prepared for me. Prepared. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Now, verse 10. But God hath revealed them, them what? Them good things that he's prepared for us because we love him. God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, or yes, the deep things of God. That means we're getting ready to get deep. And we're going to get deep because we can get deep. And we're expected to get deep. And we're expecting to have a great understanding of what God has prepared for us. Because God says, I'm going to show you things by my Spirit. And the Spirit of the Lord is not going to direct you into crazy things because God is not the author of confusion or of craziness. God is the author of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So God says, I want to reveal unto you spiritual information of what belongs to you. And when you start finding out what belongs to you and you start walking in it, things are going to start happening. Things will start happening for you. And you'll be like, man, I've been living all my life. I, re I remember I was a Christian when I received Jesus when I was five years of age. And I did not know that I was an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. I did not know I had authority to use the name of Jesus. I didn't know the devil was afraid of me. I didn't know that I had things prepared for me by God for me to enjoy. But I was told, do the best you can. If it's the Lord's will, you may make it. And really, I literally got sick in one event that I went to. They told me, well, what's it like for you to be in the, the pigmentation of your skin color and so forth? And they were, we had all these different races and whatnot. And they said, well, you know, uh, you're just condemned. And they were trying to be sensitive. They were trying to say to me, you know, because this is the way the things worked out in the earth realm. As a black man, you're just condemned. And I'm thinking, but I am a Christian. But they're like, we ain't telling you what it means to be a Christian. We're going to talk about the pigmentation of your skin and what happened to you and the atrocities. And all. I'm like, I literally got sick to my stomach. And then I found out that faith, confidence in God's word, supersedes the atrocities of man. I found out that if I focus in on my spiritual new creation reality of who I am, it doesn't matter what color my skin is. Because that's a trip bag for people who are whatever colors. There are people that have... Uh, different aspects of their physical anatomy. They think, oh, this is what makes me who I am. <laughs> you find out your physical anatomy is not who you are. But the real you is a spirit. And if you're in Christ Jesus, you have an inheritance and some good things have been prepared for you because you love the Lord. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you don't have a clue as to what I'm talking about. 
But he said here, God said, I'm revealing those things unto them who are new creation people. Verse 10, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God, everybody underline the words, things of God. See, God has things. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So the things that are of God, who knows about those things? It's open book test. Who knows about those things? The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit knows about the things that God possesses. And the Holy Spirit wants to communicate unto us who believe on the Lord, who are new creation people, who are spiritually alive. The Holy Spirit wants to what? He wants to communicate those things unto us so that we can enjoy those things. I know it's country where it's them things. God wants you to enjoy them things that he has for you. Why? Because it gives the Father pleasure to bless you and to have you enjoy them things that he provided for you. All right, so the Holy Spirit's been sent unto us to inform us of them things, them deep things. Verse 11. I know it's kind of redundant, but I'm doing that on purpose. All right, verse 11. For what man knoweth the, the things of man, of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know, circle the word know, know the things that are freely given to us of God. So how much do them things cost? It's free. It's free to us who believe on the Lord Jesus. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, this is a person that's not born again, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For the things... They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual, that's us, judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So everybody say, I have the mind of Christ. Therefore, I'm willing to learn about them things. The Holy Spirit wants to teach me that belongs to me in Christ. All right, let's look at verse 1 of chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. In other words, I wanted to talk to you about fluidly in a way in which I can just have this conversation from the word. I just want to talk to you about what belongs to you, what things you possess. I just want to get into that. But he said, what? I want to speak to you in spiritual conversation, but I couldn't do that. Verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Carnal means fleshly. Even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal, fleshly. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Margin, my Bible says, walking like mere men. That means you're walking like people that don't have an inheritance. You walk around like people that don't have things that belong to you. And Paul the Apostle said, I want to get this across to you, but in order for you to get this across to you, you've got to recognize there is a difference between you, O believer, and those that are not believers. And be those who are in Christ Jesus, you're a new creature, and you need to start beholding 
what belongs to you. Now, what is it that the believer has that they must be aware of? You must be aware that you are a possessor of faith. You are in possession of faith, the God kind of faith. And because you are in possession of the God kind of faith, God expects you to grow in your faith. He expects your faith to be exceedingly growing. Why? Because the more you grow in faith, the more you can do in faith. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Now, Paul then identified believers that were acting like natural folks. Why? Because of their ignorance and because they were looking at themselves only through one way. They were looking at themselves fleshly instead of looking at themselves spiritually. And Paul said, I want to feed you with the good meat of the spiritual word of God, but I had to drop down to the milk of the word of God, which is still the word of God. But I had talked to you from a spiritual milk position like a baby. You know you're a Christian. That's milk conversation to one who is a Christian, but one who is actually now ready to apply what they learn. There's some things that you're going to find out about that you can do that belong to you, and you'll be moving mountains. And you'll become unlimited, unlimited in your ability to produce. Turn over to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Romans 12, 3. And I'll say this. Romans 12, 3. We're talking about exceedingly growing faith. And we want to let our viewing audience that's watching us live, we thank you. We appreciate you for tuning in on this live service. We encourage you to come and be with us here in the live service so that you can truly experience praise and worship and the ability to serve God in a place where he calls his house. For those that are planted in the Lord are going to have results. And planted in the house of God, you're going to have God to move on your behalf. Thank you for tuning in. Have a blessed and wonderful day. And remember, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good Blessed is the man, the woman, the boy, and the girl that trusts in him, in Jesus' name. Wonderful. All right, you're there in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt God has, or hath, is the old English word for has, dealt, dealt means that it has been portioned out to every man that is, that what? Every man, the measure of faith. So all of us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you. 
be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.